I'm Lillian Fiddler, Victor Oscar One X-Ray Yankee Lima, and I'm coming to you from Signal Hill in St. John's, Newfoundland, where Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless signal. In 1901, Marconi received the letter S in Morse code from across the Atlantic in south, on the coast of southwest England. And we've come a long way since then, and we're going even further today. Uh, we're going out into space to connect with an astronaut aboard the International Space Station. And like myself, that astronaut, Laurel O'Hara, KI-5 Tango Oscar Mike, is also an amateur radio operator. If you think that amateur radio is something old from the past, Here's something to illustrate that amateur radio is very much alive and flourishing today. We live in an age of amazing technology. But for some people, just being a consumer of off-the-shelf gadgets isn't enough. If you're bored with this and looking for something more exciting, why not take a trip around the world at the speed of light? Delta Kilo 8 Lima Golf, this is Mike X-Ray Zero Sierra Sierra Whiskey. Okay, thank you Frank for coming back to my QRZ call. My name is Adam, as in Alpha Delta Alpha Mike, Alpha Delta Alpha Mike, Adam, Adam is my name. I we all love to communicate. Amateur radio takes you beyond being a mere gadget user. It challenges you by putting you in charge of the technology. The bit that always interested me in the amateur radio was always the construction. One of the big things I've been interested in constructing is uh, using the Raspberry Pi in amateur radio because it's a small single board computer. It has a lot of potential, a lot of opportunities. So we're building a radio uh, receiver. Okay. And so I'm just on the part which is the demodulator. This is a hobby with hundreds of different ways to have techie fun. Using this simple ham radio transceiver and a good antenna, you can talk to other amateurs around the world and you can do it from almost anywhere. I'm at a portable station. The radio signals you transmit travel around the world at the speed of light. No internet connection or mobile phone signals are needed. Just your own skills as a radio ham. I'm 11 years old and I'm about to do the foundation license here in England, over. I got into amateur radio really to get a greater understanding of technology. I spend so much time on my phone, on laptops and really have no idea how any of it works. It was a really, really welcoming experience for me, um, a really great community and really, really easy to actually do. In disaster situations, when normal communications are out of action, amateur radio still gets the message through which is why many hams belong to organisations that train their members to provide emergency radio links when needed. I like the practicality of being able to send a message and know how to get something out to someone under your own steam, so kind of making it yourself and I'm very interested in being able to do the electronics, being able to build things, being able to be self-reliant. Um, in communication, I think that's really interesting. It's great fun talking to other hands in unusual and sometimes exotic places around the world. And beyond. The International Space Station carries ham radio gear on board and there's always licensed amateurs among the crew to use it, such as Commander Doug Wheelock. Uh, I've really enjoyed using the ham radio and uh, talking to ham radio operators all over the world. Radio amateurs around the world also build and launch their own satellites and hams anywhere can use them for space communication experiments and of course to chat to each other. Golf 1 X-Ray India Echo. Uh, Golf 1 X-Ray India Echo, uh, Golf Bravo 1 Yankee Oscar Tango America afternoon, uh, 5 and 9. We're using SO50 which is an FM uh, transponder uh, satellite. 
which was going over from uh, about west to north, around uh, 70 degrees elevation. When computers and radios come together, there's a whole bunch of new opportunities for hands to connect by radio, sending text, transmitting pictures or real-time video, even displaying data from an amateur radio satellite orbiting the Earth. Mike 6, November Yankee Kilo. CQ, 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 GB1, Yuta. I got started in amateur radio because I'm a girl guide leader and I wanted to take up a hobby that I could do with my brownies. The interesting aspect of amateur radio is that you do learn how it works and um, you get to communicate with loads of different people, find out about different areas of the world. You learn a bit more about the science of how it works and you have a much more profound understanding of something, a technology that is going on all around you. In amateur radio, sport and radio fit together well too. I'll take another bearing in a minute because I don't trust that. These guys are trying to locate hidden radio transmitters, racing against each other and the clock. Amateur radio is a fantastic hobby for anybody who loves technology. I've only really been involved in the hobby for a really short amount of time and I've been speaking to people all across the world. It's a really, really inviting community. One minute you're speaking to somebody about amateur radio and it leads on to so many other discussions about other different technologies you may not have even thought of. So if you do get a chance, come and join us. It's very obvious that amateur radio is still leading the way in telecommunications today. And the international sp while the International Space Station is orbiting the Earth, we are going to connect students in four different schools with an astronaut aboard the ISS. And those schools are Leary's Junior High, Leary's Brook Junior High, St. Paul's Junior High, Al Amalgamated Academy, and Mount Pearl Intermediate. Students will be asking questions to astronaut Laurel O'Hara. And just to give you an idea of what's involved in putting all this together, have a look at this. Hi, my name is Ruth. And my name is Chris. You must be pretty excited to talk directly with astronauts on the International Space Station today. While we're waiting for the space station to come over your portion of the sky, let's talk a little bit about how it's going to happen. Of course, Mission Control is in contact with astronauts all the time, using a big radio with lots of fancy equipment. However, we're going to be using something very different today. We are going to use ham or amateur radio to talk directly to the International Space Station. When most people hear the word radio, they think of a music radio station. But it's so much more than that. Radio actually refers to the unseen energy that transmits all sorts of signals using electromagnetic waves. At first, people learned how to send signals like Morse code. And then they discovered that you can send so much more like data, computer signals, and even TV. Maybe you don't realize it, but you use radio every day. Maybe you watched the TV this morning, or you texted your friends, or maybe even you check social media like Twitter or Instagram. Let's travel back to space for a minute. Since the beginning of the space age, humans have sent many spacecraft out into the universe. These range from the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting the Earth daily, and the Curiosity rover exploring Mars. We've even sent a long-distance messenger, the Voyager 1, who has traveled outside of our solar system. Whether it's capturing a great picture of a far-off galaxy or conducting experiments on the space station, radio has to do with all of these. And today, you're going to be using ham radio. Now you might be wondering, what exactly is ham radio? Amateur or ham radio is a service and a hobby where operators can talk with people around their neighborhoods, their cities, their country, and even around the world. Amateur radio operators require a radio license from the government. They're not that hard to get. I have one. My call sign is KM4LAO. And mine is KD8YVJ. Our call signs are a way of identifying who we are to other operators. This lets everyone know that we have the proper license to using the radios. 
As amateur radio operators, or hands as we are often called, we can talk with others about basically whatever we want, often science or some new radio gadget that we are interested in. Let's focus back to the space station and your contact today. Many of the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the space station are licensed ham radio operators. That's why your operators today can contact them. The people here, as well as the astronauts, are licensed to talk to each other, and you are allowed to talk over to their radio. For our conversation today, we'll need an amateur radio station on the ground, either in this location or somewhere else around the world. We'll also need a radio in the space station. NA1SS, NA1SS. You can hear the calls coming. This is November Alpha 1 Sierra Sierra, the International Space Station. Over. On the space station, the radio transceiver is connected to an amateur radio antenna mounted on the outside. One of these antennas will be used today during our contact. For our side of the contact, we need a good sized antenna, a signal amplifier, something to make our signal stronger, and a rotator for turning our antenna. We have to keep our antenna pointed right at the International Space Station. And remember, it's moving across the sky and fast. To aim the antenna properly, we need to track the path of the space station exactly. NASA uses complex systems to track the path of the space station and other orbiting objects. The satellite tracking program we are using works out a complicated set of mathematics to provide the orbital location of the space station moment by moment as it moves through space. This information is sent to the computer that controls the antenna rotator, which moves the antenna to follow the space station. Maybe some of you have seen or worked with robotics. That's pretty cool stuff. And just like you can program a robot where to go, what to do, and how to get there, you can also program a computer to tell an antenna how to track the space station across the sky. You know, it took a lot of planning to get this contact. Several weeks ago, the ARIS operations team had to figure out when the space station's orbit would pass over this location. Then, they had to talk with the planners at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew's time is pretty full, so they were able to find a time that could work for the crew members' schedules. Once they found times that would work both in space and here on the ground, the host organized this contact. And in just a few minutes, you'll be hearing and talking to the astronauts. Well, it's almost time for your contact. It will be exciting, so good luck with it! And now, it's time to introduce you to the astronaut we'll be talking to today, Laurel O'Hara, KI-5 Tango Oscar Mike. I've wanted to explore ever since I was a little kid, and I'm not totally sure where that came from. I've just always been really curious and interested in other places. And so from a pretty young age, I just wanted to be an explorer. And I grew up in Houston, so NASA was right down the road. And we got to come to JSC a lot um, on school field trips, and then also when I was in second grade. We grew some tomato seeds that had flown on Space Shuttle, so we got to do the Tomato Seeds in Space program. Just that early exposure to NASA, I think, focused me on an astronaut as being one way to be an explorer. And that dream kind of persisted all the way through school and college. So I graduated from undergrad and then worked for a year and a half and then went back to grad school for two years. And I did all of that in aerospace engineering. And my sister was a geologist at Penn State, also in grad school at the time, and her research was in Iceland studying the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the fault lines that run through Iceland. And that sounded really fun and kind of like what I had dreamed about in exploration. And so I started looking around for different opportunities and found Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, and that's how I moved into ocean science. Woods Hole does kind of the broad suite of earth and ocean science. They do everything from biology, chemistry, geosciences, and then they also have a pretty big engineering department. And so I joined the engineering department. When I started at Woods Hole, I started on an upgrade to the Alvin submersible. So it's the United States only manned research submersible and the oldest sub in the world that does that kind of work. And at the time we were doing the first of a two-part upgrade to the sub. 
to do a lot of different upgrades, but mainly to increase the operating depth of the sub from 4,500 meters to 6,500 meters. But one of the things I was responsible for was the main vehicle frame, the overall kind of skeleton of Alvin that attaches the personnel sphere, like where the people are. So it was this huge seven foot diameter titanium sphere with all these lugs welded onto it. And the main vehicle frame was also uh, this welded structure. And then these two parts showed up to Woods Hole separately. And one day we had to mate them. And so seeing the sphere come down onto the vehicle frame and making sure every bolt went through every lug uh, was a pretty great day. This is the kind of work I want to be doing. It's really hands-on. Um, it's working with a lot of different people from around the world, working on science that helps us understand the planet better. And so I started to think that maybe I would stay there for a while. I went all the way through with the Alvin upgrade. And one of the things that I really was hoping to do was to get to dive in Alvin one time. And I did get to do that on sea trials. It was neat to see the vehicle you know, in action. And I got to fly it for a little bit. Uh, which was really fun. In addition to my work on Alvin, I also did a lot of work with uh, robots. Um, so either remotely operated vehicles uh, that were driven from the ship or autonomous vehicles that you know, had their own brain on board. My work with all of these vehicles were mostly at sea and we would go out on research cruises that were anywhere from two or three weeks to a month or two. So Jason is the name of the vehicle that I did most of my work with, and it's an ROV, so it's a remotely operated vehicle. And we lower it over the side of the ship, um, and it stays tethered to the ship. So uh, there's a tether that's providing electrical power and communications to the vehicle. And then the pilot sits on board in a control room and drives the vehicle from the control room. We have a pilot, we have an engineer and a navigator. And so I would sit engineer and navigator in the control room and then also work as a mechanic on the vehicle and as a data processor. A lot of the work that we did with those vehicles was around hydrothermal vents. And so you would see, they call them black smokers. And so they're kind of like chimneys with black smoke spewing out underwater and just this wealth of animal life that lives around them. And so they were just these really beautiful spots on the seafloor that we got to go visit those cruises were sort of like the highlight of my career. And I love the research cruises because I think for the same reason that I really enjoy the work here. And that's just going out on a ship with a relatively small group of people and a pretty focused mission and having to use, you know, whatever we have out on the ship to solve problems and fix things when they break. And you just kind of develop a really nice team dynamic out there. And the work is really fun and interesting. Most of what we were doing was science aimed at understanding the oceans better. And so the overall mission was really great. And similarly at NASA, our mission is to explore, both to inspire people on Earth to develop new technology and to take humans further and further in the solar system. And so uh, working on things like that that have a worldwide impact and that are ultimately for the greater good I think is really sort of the overarching thing that draws me to exploration. I'm Laurel O'Hara and I'm a NASA astronaut. Subscribe for more space. Now that you've learned a little bit about amateur radio and also what it takes to put this kind of contact together, I can tell you, and you can probably see, that it's very windy up here uh, on Signal Hill. The weather here is still quite chilly, uh, although spring is on the way. And we're going to find out now what it's like, what the weather is like in space. We have Dr. Tamitha Scove who's going to join us and tell us what the space weather is. Over to you, Dr. Scove. Hi, Lillian. 
As we take a look at space weather this week, we've actually calming down a little bit. We've been getting a lot of activity from region 36, 14, and 15. 36, 14 has been firing off some solar storms, and 36, 15 has been our major flare player. And back on the 23rd, they both light up at the same time. You can see it right here. Bam! Right there, we've got a big solar storm launch from region 3614, and 3615 fires off a big solar flare. In fact, together, they made this a big X-class flare. You can see it right here. You can see that uh, region uh, was on the day side. This lights up in a big solar flare, and now watch all these radio contacts on Earth's day side. Watch all the, con the, the lines disappear when that big flare hits. Look at them all disappear for a short bit there. That was an R3 level radio blackout, and that caused a lot of issues on the amateur radio bands. On top of that, we also had a big solar storm being launched, as I mentioned, and you can see in coronagraphs, this is an instrument where we make a false eclipse. So we have the sun kind of in the center here, and this image is kind of like a bigger or stronger version of this one. And so we blocked out the sun to create a false eclipse so we can see this, the the corona of the sun, that's the sun's atmosphere. And look at this big blast wave coming off. In fact, as I push it forward, you'll see it blasting off down here as well. Do you see that? You can see it all the way around the sun. We call this a full halo, which means that's a big solar storm coming towards Earth. And in fact, this solar storm did hit Earth on the 24th. It did give us some aurora for a little while, so you can definitely ask the astronauts if they happen to see any aurora for a short bit late on the 24th. But it also caused a big radiation storm, and that's what we're watching now. Watch, you'll see down in the south and in the north. Watch it light up a little bit. See them? See all these, uh, these regions? This is a particle radiation storm, which affects radio communications, again, especially up at the poles. You can see all these radio contacts, all the lines. Watch the hole open up in the middle of this. This is what we call a polar cap absorption event, and it means that radio communications and navigation, even satellite signals, are really kind of hard to hear and understand because we have all of this radiation noise up here. And also with the astronauts, they may have actually had to, to take shelter for a short while during the peak of this radiation storm, but you can see it starts getting a bit stronger. So this has been stuff that we've had to deal with. We're getting more radio blackouts. As you can see, the contacts disappear with a R2 level radio blackout. Here's an R1 level radio blackout. And again, the contacts disappear a little bit. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders have had to deal with all of this noise on the day side radio bands as region 36, 14 and 15 are beginning to rotate take to the sun's west limb. Thank goodness they're finally beginning to quiet down. But as they quiet down, regions 3620 and 3622 are looking like they're becoming active. These regions have actually, as a matter of fact, one shot, this one shot a solar storm right there. And look here on the edge. Do you see this poof that's kind of like ongoing there? That little kind of blast, that is a region that has yet to rotate into Earth view. In fact, as we switch to our far-sided sun, now this is the part of the sun that is not facing Earth right now, and we're simulating it because we don't have any eyes on the far side of the sun, so we have to kind of take an educated guess as to what regions that we saw that used to be on the front side of the sun are now on the far side. And in fact, one of them that is a big flare player that we remember from last time it rotated into Earth view is region 3599. And as you can see here, as this region begins to rotate to the sun's west limb, this is on the far side. So it's gonna rotate into Earth view here over the next couple days. This region has definitely given us lots of big radio blackouts and some solar storm launches. So this is the region we're gonna be watching for because I bet you it's this region that's gonna be rotating into view over the next couple days. And that means more radio blackouts are on the menu and more issues with amateur radio over this next week. Hello, I'm Robert Thirsk, a former astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency, and I send my greetings to the students who will be participating in the upcoming radio contact uh, from St. John's, Newfoundland with the International Space Station. During both of my previous uh, flights, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, students in classrooms around the world, 
and all of these radio contacts were memorable and gratifying for me. And even across the vast distances of space, I could sense the excitement in the voices of the participating students in their classrooms down below. Who knows, a uh, radio contact uh, between a student and a space station astronaut could be the spark that inspires a future career in telecommunications or in space exploration. So all my best to the students for their upcoming March 27th encounter with space station astronauts. I know that the contact event will unfold beautifully. Goodbye. Well, it looks like we're just about ready to th get the ball rolling here. And we've got Steve McFarlane, who's with ARIS. And his call sign is VE3 Tango Bravo Delta. He's standing by, and he's going to coordinate with the ground station in Belgium. And that is Yan, Oscar November 7 uniform x-ray. The students are all ready and waiting, and we are just about ready to get things going. So I'm going to hand it over to Steve McFarlane. Okay, so we're about T-minus six minutes, or just under. So well, hello everyone, this is Steve McFarlane, VE3TBD, your amateur radio moderator for today. Through the help of amateur radio volunteers and the crew on the ISS, we hope to soon establish ham radio contact with the International Space Station as it flies more than 350 kilometers above the Earth towards Belgium. This is all accomplished with ARIS, amateur radio on the International Space Station. The ISS is currently flying over the Atlantic Ocean and is on a southwest to northeast heading whizzing along at about 28,000 kilometers an hour. The contact will be performed using the Amateur Radio Television Network, a worldwide network of amateur radio ground stations that enable students to contact the ISS. We call this one a multi-point contact as students come from a variety of high schools in St. John's and are connected via one common Zoom link. ARIS is a consortium of hand radio volunteers from nine nations that develop and operate the amateur radio station on the International Space Station. Some members of ARIS are the American Radio Relay League, the worldwide AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Corporations, CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, the European Space Agency, JAXA, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, NASA, the, Na the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and Roscosmos, the Russian Federal Space Agency. The amateur radio ground station that will establish contact with the ISS is ON4 ISS in Antwerp, Belgium, operated by Yann Popelier, ON7UX. Thanks for helping us out, Yann. Our contact today is Laura O'Hara, KI5TOM, who will be operating OR4 ISS on board the International Space Station. Laura will be talking with students from St. John's School Authority in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. I am ready. Over. Okay, I think the first first question is ready. Go ahead. Um, Marie, and uh, can you describe what Earth looks like from your view over? Uh, in a word, vibrant. It, there's so much color, the planet is so alive, it can fly in space. Uh, but at the same time, you see the atmosphere as this very thin, light blue line along the surface, uh, which gives it this great sense of fragility at the same time. Over. Okay, I'm asking a question on behalf of uh, St. Paul's Junior High and Miss Walsh's class. They couldn't be with us today, so I'll be asking their questions. Their question is, did you learn anything in junior high uh, that is useful to you in your life as an astronaut? Over. Absolutely. Uh, those were, and I still think are, some tough few years. I think school is important. It lays the groundwork for everything else you're going to do in your life. Uh, but equally important is learning how to be kind to people in any situation and developing the confidence to be yourself no matter what. Next question is on behalf of Ms. Kellaway's class. Um, 
What training do you receive to respond to a serious injury or illness while in space? Over. Astronauts get basic medical training. So we're able to do things like um, draw blood, of course, start IVs or give oxygen. And we're also able to do basic dental work, surprisingly. Um, this, of course, is all in close coordination with doctors on the ground. Over. Next question is on behalf of Mr. Kennedy's class uh, from St. Paul's Junior High. Uh, what kind of experiments are being carried out on board the International Space Station these days? Over. We do a wide variety of research up here, everything from life sciences, where we're studying human cells and growing plants, to material science, doing things like 3D printing metal uh, to make tools. We do combustion studies on how flames behave in space, and we do a lot of health sciences where we are actually the research subject. Uh, the diversity makes it fun and keeps it always interesting. Over. Next question. How long did it take to become an astronaut? What was your path slash education that led to this career over? Well, I would say it really took my entire life uh, because I use skills that I gained throughout my life here. Uh, but seriously, training takes about two years initially, and then we train about one and a half years for our specific mission. I studied aerospace engineering in college, and then after that worked in ocean science as an engineer and operator of underwater robots before I came to NASA. Over. Those being and the ISS give you the same feeling as pulling out of the driveway to go on a trip, or is it a different sense of homesickness? Over. Well, I think it's like pulling out of the driveway to go on the trip of a lifetime. Uh, this has been the best adventure, and I miss specific things from Earth, like seeing my friends and family and weather, uh, but I haven't really been homesick getting to look back at our beautiful planet every day. Over. Hi, I'm Thalia. Do you believe there could be life on another planet? Over. I hope so. Um, I think if we find it, it might be in oceans on other planets, which I think are one really interesting place in our solar system that we haven't really gone to explore yet. Over. Another question on behalf of Miss Walsh's class. Um, is there anything that surprised you about space? Over. There are lots of things that surprised me. I think one of those things is just uh, the experience of floating. Um, and living and working in microgravity. There are so many little things that I hadn't even considered um, about what that involves that every day um, I'm both delighted and surprised uh, just by floating around space station. Over. This question again on behalf of Ms. Kellaway's class. Um, during your journey to and from space, do you prefer ascending into space or descending back to Earth? Over. So far, I have only ascended, um, and that was epic. Launch day was an amazing day. Um, I think descending when I return to Earth will be harder. Uh, just the idea of going back and relearning how to live in microgravity—sorry, uh, live in gravity um, on Earth—I think that'll be more challenging than um, coming up to microgravity. Over. This question on behalf of Mr. Kennedy's class. Um, how do you keep a daily routine without a single sunrise or sunset? Over. It does kind of mess up your sense of time. Um, I lose track of time really easily up here, but we work on Greenwich Mean Time, so we keep pretty regular hours, uh, same as you would on Earth, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, but we're on GMT. Over. Next question. What is the travel time to the space station? Over. 
It depends on the vehicle you're flying and then also the planned trajectory for that vehicle. Uh, but it took me and my crew about three and a half hours to get from Earth to space station. So uh, that is very fast. Over. How does being on the ISS change your appreciation for planet Earth? Over. That's been one of my favorite parts about being here. And it's really given me just a deep sense of connection to planet Earth and, and an appreciation for the diversity and the complexity of life that planet Earth sustains. Um, I definitely have an increased desire to protect Earth and conserve what we still have over. How do you use the bathroom in space over? Well, without gravity, our bathroom works very differently than bathrooms on Earth, uh, where you have water and gravity helps move that water through the pipe. Our bathroom, our toilet works uh, with air and a vacuum system. So kind of like your vacuum cleaner at home, uh, that's the basis for our toilet on board space stations. Over. This question on behalf of Ms. Walsh's class again. Um, what advice do you have for students who are interested in pursuing space science as a potential career? Over. Great question. And there's so many different things that you can do in the space science field. Uh, one piece of advice I would say is to look for people who are doing things that you find interesting. So people who are older than you doing work that you think is interesting and then see what path they took to get there. There are many ways to uh, get somewhere that you want to be, uh, but that is a good way to get ideas of all the different options and possibilities that are out there. Over. Uh, on behalf of Ms. Kellaway's class again, uh, how does the ISS protect itself from space debris? Over. An important question. There's a lot of space debris up here, uh, but we actually have teams on the ground who monitor for space debris headed our way. And if they see something that they're worried about, then ISS has the capability to fire thrusters and actually move the entire space station out of the way. So every now and then they'll let us know something's headed our way and we'll get ready to fire our thrusters if needed. But uh, usually that actually doesn't happen. The debris goes off on a different trajectory and uh, doesn't head towards us. Over. Does your physical view and perspective on space change while you are on station? Over. Looking out the windows we have at night are, is one of my favorite things to do here. The stars from space station and low Earth orbit are brighter and clearer than the stars you see on Earth. And so it's just the sea of stars in the sky. The night sky looks almost silver because there's so many stars. And uh, when I'm looking out our windows, I think I've never felt smaller or more insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but also uh, so connected to Earth. You really realize how special a place we have over. Question? How many people are in this space station right now? How big is the space station itself? Over. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for making time for this contact. We have lots of senior, lots of senior. We will ask you November 4. Sierra Sierra closing with us November 4. I insist for you to scan the contact. 7 3. Thank you, Yan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, well done. 17 questions asked. Just missed that last one. So I'll just close with a few remarks. So everyone, we have shared a moment of history. Amateur radio station ON4 ISS in Antwerp, Belgium, operated by Yang Popidier, ON7UX, contacted Laurel O'Hara, KI5TOM, aboard the International Space Station, speaking with students at St. John's Authority in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Congratulations to all students involved. Give yourselves a big hand. Now, for the international volunteer team of ARIS, including radio amateur satellite corporations around the world, the American Re Radio Relay League, CSA, ESA, JAXA, NASA, and Roscosmos, this is Steve McFarland sending my greetings to all of you in amateur radio terms. 73 from VE3 TBD. Once again, congratulations, St. John's. Well done. Lillian, back to you.
Thank you so much, Laurel, for taking the time to answer those questions for the students. I'm sure it's something they'll never forget. This has been an awesome moment for us here in Newfoundland as well, and it gives us a sense of pride to have been here in Newfoundland receiving the doing this contact where Marconi also received the first transatlantic wireless signal. I want to thank everybody who participated and made, made this happen. Um, from ARIS, NASA, the schools, and everybody else involved. Thank you so much. And from myself, Lillian, Victor Oscar One, X-Ray Yankee Lima, and Jim, Victor Oscar One, Romeo Victor. Thank you so much and 73. Seller production. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent.